Hi, this is Professor Dorr, and this is EE310 lecture number 18, Bodhi Plots 2. In the last lecture, you learned how to do Bodhi magnitude plots. In this lecture, you're going to learn how to plot phase of transfer functions on a Bodhi plot. <laughs> and we're going to do some different examples. And one of the examples, I'm going to mix up hertz and radians per second, because sometimes students have a little trouble with that. Not, not trouble understanding it, but trouble actually doing it on exams, actually working with it. So we'll do an example of that. And I'm going to relate the 20 dB per decade that we were talking about in the last lecture to 6 dB per octave. And you're going to see that that's actually going to just be a very small part of the lecture because it's really straightforward, but I want you to understand it. The next part of the lecture, I'm going to try to give you some insight on what poles and zeros really are. Uh, we use the term zero and pole, and we use the term pole frequencies and zero frequencies, but I want you to understand what poles and zeros really mean. And once you understand that, I'm going to show you a graphical technique for obtaining the frequency response of a transfer function based on the location of its poles and zeros. Now you might say, why is that important? And the reason why that's important is that's how real smart people have figured out how to make good electronic filters, i.e., we can make filters that are nice and flat in the pass band and then fall off very quickly in the stop band. And the basis for that kind of design is geometrical. And I want to give you a little taste of that by showing you how it's done with poles and zeros. <clears throat> so what we talked about in our last couple of lectures is that frequency response plots have two components. They have a, there's a magnitude versus frequency plot and a phase versus pre frequency plot. So when we want a frequency response plot, we really mean two plots. Uh, sometimes in the frequency response um, for an op amp on a data sheet or something, you might see both plots on or bo both of them on one plot. And what they'll do is the left-hand axis will be in dB and used for the magnitude plot, and then the right-hand uh, axis will be used for phase, and that'll represent the phase plot. So we can throw them on one plot if we want, but they're really two separate plots. What we found in the last lecture is that since we plot magnitude in dB, we can add the contributions from each factor in the transfer function. And that really made it easy to break the transfer function down into little mathematical Lego pieces, and we handled each one independently. But how do we plot the phase of a transfer function? Again, we'll go back to the first principles because it's really pretty easy. So our transfer function will have a bunch of different terms. It'll have a constant term. It will have a zero at the origin like this, or maybe a pole at the origin if that j omega is downstairs. It will have simple poles, or I'm sorry, simple zeros like these. It'll have simple poles like these, and it could also have complex poles and zeros. So. Let's start off with the phase. Actually, we'll, no, let's keep going. So here is the transfer function in the form that we like to use for Bode plots. Remember that 1 plus j omega over something? That's the form we like. So let's now represent it in polar form. So the transfer function looks like, of course, the constant terms times j omega. That's going to look like omega at an angle of 90 degrees. Times, um, we'll say term 1 here, 
we have the magnitude of term 1, which is, of course, a function of s or j omega. And then we have the phase angle of term 1, which is shown over here. And we see that the amplitude is a function of frequency through s. And we see that the phase is a function of frequency through s. So here's our polar form of our transfer function. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to break up the magnitude and the phase parts. So the constant term, we'll just leave that alone, but let's deal with the magnitude parts. I have omega, I have magnitude of term 1, magnitude of term 2, divided by magnitude term 3, all that stuff. But now I put my phase together, and I have my 90 degrees plus the phase from term 1s of s plus the phase of term 2 of s minus the phase of term 3 of s or s. So in the last lecture, we took these and we said, you know, if we put these in dB, we have to take the log and the, um, the product um, of the terms here allows us to just sum the logs of these individual terms. In other words, the log of the product is going to be the sum of the log of the, of the factors. But we did that in the last lecture. Now we're going to look at phase angle. And what we see is that the phase angles, they just add together. So we can do something fairly similar to what we did for the magnitude. The magnitudes added together because the logs added. The phase terms add because that's just what we do when we multiply them together. So the phase angles add, and we can deal with each term independently. So again, we have little mathematical Legos, and we're going to add them all up on our frequency response plot. So let's start off with the factor k. k has no phase angle, and it certainly has no frequency dependence. So as far as a phase plot is concerned, we don't care about the amplitude. So it doesn't get to play over here. Now let's look at the factor j omega. So for j omega, it's going to give us a constant phase angle. Why? j omega, 90 degrees. And that 90 degrees is not going to change with omega. So it gives me a constant phase angle. The factor 1 over j omega, if I had a 1 over j omega right here, it would give me a um, negative 90 degree phase angle. Now let's look at the, the simple poles and simple zeros. So the factor is 1 plus j omega over omega z for a zero. If it was a pole term, it'd be 1 plus j omega over omega p. So what is the phase? Well, let's start with the exact phase, and then we'll figure out how to approximate it for a Bode plot. So the phase is going to be the arc tangent of omega over omega z, divided by 1, of course, which means it's just the arc tangent of omega over omega z. Let's take a look. If omega is 0, the arc tangent of 0 is going to be 0, duh. If omega is equal to the 0 frequency, now we have the arc tangent of 1. Um, so, or in other words, the real part and the imaginary part are the same. So, of course, we're going to have a 45 degree phase angle at omega z. And if omega is infinity, I'm going to have the arc tangent of infinity, which is 90 degrees. So here we have a zero term, and we know that at zero frequency, we're going to have zero phase angle, and at infinite frequency, we're going to have 90 degrees of phase angle. But we need to do better than that. We need to make our plots a little more accurate. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to somewhat arbitrarily 
say, you know, we know that when omega is equal to omega z, the phase angle is going to be 45 degrees, right? We know that. And that's going to be exact. But what's the phase angle be at, oh, let's say one decade below um, the, the zero frequency? Just what is it? And we work that out, and we get it is going to be 5.7 degrees. Then we say, all right, let's see what the phase angle is at 10 times omega z. And we find it's 84.3. So we say, hmm, we know that it's zero here and it's 90 degrees up here. But we also know that by the time we get to a tenth of the zero frequency, we're pretty close to zero. And when we get to 10 times the zero frequency, we're pretty close to 90 degrees. So what we're going to do is say that our approximation is going to be the phase at the zero frequency is going to be 45. The phase at a tenth of the zero frequency is equal to zero. The phase at 10 times the zero frequency is going to be 90. And that's going to be our rule. And we'll say we got no error at the zero frequency. And we got about six degrees of error here and six degrees of error here. But we, we just won't worry about that for our approximation. And now we know how to handle the phase of a zero that looks like this or a pole that looks like this. In the pole case, it would go down 45 degrees and it would be negative 45 at the pole frequency and negative 90 at infinity. So before I keep going, let's make a little comparison to phase terms and magnitude terms. You might remember that when we have a single pole, it starts off at 0 dB. And then when it hits the break frequency, it starts going down at negative 20 dB per decade. And it keeps going down. Remember on the plot in the last lecture, I drew a little arrow to show that that pole frequency response just kept going. And if you had, for example, a zero and a pole, and they both went off to oblivion, they would cancel to make a flat line. But what I really want to, um, the differentiation I want to make is that pole and zero constituents, they keep going at their whatever angle they're at. For phase contributions, a zero or a pole, it, it begins making a phase contribution. And then once it gets where it's going, it stops. That is for the phase of these terms. Of course, for the phase of this term, it'll remain 90 degrees at all frequencies. But for these terms, I want you to just remember that they start off at zero, and then they're going to end up at 90 degrees or negative 90 degrees. So they stop making a contribution. Make sure you keep that straight between magnitude and phase plots. So let's just do it. This is the transfer function that we worked with in the last lecture. Um, this transfer function, we got the magnitude response in our last lecture. Now we're going to get the phase response. So here it is. What do I see? I see a constant term. That does not affect the phase response. So I'm just not going to worry about it. I see a zero at the origin, that's going to give me plus 90 degrees. And I see three uh, poles. Now, before we really get into the problem, let me give you something that will help you check your work. So I want to know the phase at a bazillion hertz. 
or a frequency of infinity. What do I know? This term is going to camp there at 90 degrees. This term is going to, at very high frequencies, be 90. And each of these terms is going to give us minus 90. So at infinity, when I make that addition at infinity, I'm going to go up 90, I'm going to go down 90, and I'm going to go down two more 90s. So I can just look at this and say that the phase response at infinite hertz is going to be minus 180 degrees. And my Bode plot better show that. Because remember, 90 degrees here, minus 90, minus two more 90s gives me minus 180. Because the phase, I know that they all have what I call their terminal contribution. Or in other words, their contribution at infinity. This one's 90, this is minus 90, these two are minus 90. So that's just a nice way to check your work as you're doing these problems. So the first thing let's plot is our zero at the origin. That was our j omega term in the numerator, right here. And we know that it is going to give us a phase angle of 90 degrees. So let's just plot it. There it is, frequency independent. And now I look down here, and I know that I have a pole at 10 radians per second. I don't need to worry about where that is. It's going to be right here. But I've also got a, a pole at 4 radians per second. Let's make sure we know where to place that pole. Log to the base 10 of 4 gives me 0.6. So it's going to be 60% of the way from 10 to the 0 to 10 to the 1. 0, 1, 0.6. And that gives me my 4 radians per second. So I just wanted to make sure I know where it is. Let's continue. Now what I want to do is I want to plot the contribution of phase from this pole here. So I'm going to use my rule. I know that at the pole frequency, the phase will be negative 45 degrees. Here's my pole frequency, and looks like I'm negative 45, just like I should be. And at a tenth of the pole frequency, I'm going to be at 0. And at 10 times the pole frequency, I am going to be at minus 90. Now, how do I get to 10 times the pole frequency and a tenth of the pole frequency? Just move right or left one decade, or in other words, this much. If I want to go a decade greater than 10, I move that far. If I want to go a decade greater than right here, I'm going to go that far and I'll be right about there. So the point is once you know where your zero or pole frequency is, it's very easy to know where a tenth of that is. So here is the phase contribution of our of this pole right here. And you can see it starts at zero and its terminal phase is going to be minus 90 degrees. So now I've got my J omega constituent and I've got my pole constituent. Now, let's put in, let's add the, cons the uh, contribution from these two poles. Now, just like with the magnitude, I could draw two lines that are right on top of each other. But instead of doing that, I'm going to say, you know, I know these two poles add. So really what that means is that at the pole frequency of 10 radians per second, instead of being minus 45 degrees, I'm going to be minus 90 degrees, because i got two of them. And I also know that a decade below that, I'll be at zero. And a decade above that, each of these poles will give me minus 90. So that's going to put me at minus 180. So, here is the contribution from this double pole. 
So now I've got all the pieces of my phase plot. So it's time to start adding them up, and we're going to use red to add them up. So we'll start over here on the left side of the graph, and my, my um, these poles and zeros are going to give me no phase contribution at low frequency, but my 90 degrees, my j omega in the numerator will. So I, I go 90 degrees here, and then I get to a decade below 4 radians per second, which is where this pole right here starts making a contribution. And so I'm going to take my wiggler and just follow the same slope. Of course, where do I get the slope? I say that it goes down 90 degrees in two decades. So I'll put one end of my credit card here, and I'll put one end of my credit card um, 90 degrees down and a decade over. So sorry about that. I'll start here, and then I'll go 90 degrees down. I'm sorry. Let me do the skin. I'll start here, and I will go um, 90 degrees down in two decades. Because remember, I'm 45 degrees at the polar zero frequency. Had to spit that out. Didn't do a very good job. But so when I get to a tenth of my four radians per second, or a decade below, I just start going down at that slope. But then I get to my next pole beginning to contribute. And it's going to start contributing at one radian per second, which is a decade below the uh, pole frequency of 10 radians per second. And what I'm going to do now is my slope of my red line has to equal the slope that I started with right here plus this slope. Or in other words, it has to have the combinate the sum of these two slopes. So where here I was at minus 45 degrees per decade, now I'm at 45 times 3 degrees per decade. So I put my credit card or my straight edge here, and I figure out what that is. And I start right here, and I go down until somebody stops contributing. So down I go, and then I get here. And so now for this little segment, I'm not going to be 45 degrees times 3 anymore. I'm going to be 45, negative 45 degrees times 2. So you can see this line, this red line, has a little bigger slope than this red line. And then um, I am going to get to where this double pole stops contributing. Now nobody's contributing. And I land at negative 180 degrees, and I flatten out. So that's how I added all those together. Boy, a lot of places where I could make errors here. So let's do a sanity check. Let's see. I have terminal phase of 90 degrees for my, for my zero at the origin. Terminal phase of 90. Terminal phase of 180. So 90. Minus 90 gives me 0. Minus 180 gives me minus 180. So at infinite frequency, I'm at minus 180 degrees. Hey, look at that. Minus 180 degrees. Of course, it took me a few times to get it right, but what I'm showing you uh, is indeed right. Let's turn the problem around a little bit. Let's say that I'm given a Bode plot of a transfer function. And this is a magnitude plot. You can see it's in dB right here. Looks like my x-axis is in radians per second. So that works for me. And you might notice that I didn't use 100, 1,000, whatever. But I still showed my axis in decades, didn't I? That's totally fair. 
I can do that. Um, sometimes you'll do that because you want to reference everything to one particular frequency. So I can show 50, 500, 5,000. All my rules still apply. So I'm given the magnitude plot. I got my wiggler here. And I want to find the transfer function. So I'm going backwards. Our other problems, you were given a transfer function and you had to plot the magnitude or phase. Now you're given the transfer, you're given the, the magnitude plot, and we want to find the transfer function, then we're going to plot the phase. And then, just to keep it more fun, let's compute the exact solution with a computer. So what I see in my magnitude function here is that from DC to 50 radians per second, I got a flat line and the gain is 40 dB. Only thing that can do that is a constant term. So I know that 20 times the base 10 log of my constant term is equal to 40. So I work out the numbers and I say the log to the base 10 of k is equal to 40 over 20 equals 2. So k is equal to 10 squared or 100. So I got my constant term. Now at omega equals 50, the function starts dropping. And I look at this and I say, um, I went up a decade because I went from 50 to 500 and I dropped 20 dB. So at omega equals 50, the function starts dropping at 20 dB per decade. So therefore, there's a pull at omega equals 50. So I have a term of 1 over 1 plus j omega over 50. And now at omega equals 500, look what happens. My Bode plot flattens out. I had this magnitude term that was just going down into oblivion, and then it flattened out. What could do that? Only a, pull, only a zero at 500 radians per second could do that. Because this pole is going down in here, that means there has to be a zero that's going up. So my transfer function must contain a zero, 1 plus j omega over 500. Here's the zero frequency. Then I see that an omega equals 2122 hertz. The response again begins falling at 20 dB per decade. So therefore, I got to have a pull at 2122. So here's my other factor. After that, it just goes down into oblivion. And I should have an arrow here. And what that arrow means is that all the way up to infinity, that's what it's going to do. So let's just multiply out the terms. And so here is my transfer function. I have the constant term, my zero, and my two poles. Um, what's, what's the phase of this transfer function going to look like at infinite hertz? Let's see, terminal phase, plus 90, minus 90, minus 90. 90, minus 90, minus another 90 gives me minus 90 degrees. So when I plot my phase transfer function, I better be at minus 90 when I'm at very high frequencies. So now I have to plot the phase. And when you plot a Bode plot, one of the hardest things for, to do is figure out what your scale is. Like, how much should you include on the y-axis and how much should you include on the x-axis? Well, let's do our x-axis first. In theory, we would want to show from one-tenth of the lowest polar zero, or in other words, a decade below the lowest polar zero, to ten times the highest. Because if we do that, then we know that on the left side and the right side of our transfer of our plot, the phase will be flat. See that? Because 
um, the phase is going to begin um, making a contribution at a tenth of the lowest pole, or zero, all the way up to 10 times the highest one. Now, I may have a constant phase term that's just constant period, but remember what I said. At the left side of this point and the right side of this point, the line's going to be flat. But if you do that, your Bode plot just won't look cool. Um, what you really want to do in your Bode plot is you want to show a little bit of that flatness. And so what I'll usually do, because decades are cheap, is I will plot from two decades below the lowest polar zero to two decades above the highest. But that's kind of a personal preference. So for our plot, um, a tenth of our lowest pole uh, is going to be, or zero is going to be um, five radians per second. Or in other words, our lowest pole here is at 50. So we'll divide that by 10. That gives us five. And I like to put a little extra so my plot will look cool. So I kind of started here. And we want to go to 10 times the highest pole. That's going to be 10 times 21, 22. That's 21,000 about. And um, so here's 10,000. 20,000 is going to be here somewhere. Um, here's 100,000. That's probably good enough. So I've kind of done my horizontal scaling. What's my vertical scaling for a Bode plot? That's pretty easy for, for phase. Uh, if we go above 180, um, I won't say we'll wrap, but in the worst case, in the in the worst case, going from plus 180 to minus 180 covers it. The reason I stumbled is sometimes um, you might have like two zeros at the origin, so you start at 180. But those are all details. So let's plot our phase. Of this. So what are our pieces going to do? We have a pole at 50 hertz. And let's figure out where things are. 21, the base 10 log of 50 is 1.7. So that means 50 radians per second is going to be at 10 to the 1, 10 to the 2, 10 to the uh, 1.7. So you can see that this constituent from this pole at 50 radians per second goes through minus 45 at 50 and then at 5, which is just a decade below, so it's easy to find. At 5, it's 0. At 500, it's minus 90. Um, let's look at the 0 at 500 the 0 at 500 here. So I'm going to locate my um, 500 and that's going to be pretty easy. Um, here it is right here. You might say, where's your log, professor? And I'll say, I don't need one. I'm just going to go um, a decade above that 50. So I knew where 50 was, so I just went up by a decade. And I can see that at the zero frequency, my phase is 45 degrees. A decade below, it is at zero. A decade above, it is at 90. Okay, so that looks good. Now let's do our pole at 2122 radians per second. Looks like I need to do a log here. Base 10 log of 2122 is 3.32. Here's 10 to the 3rd. Here's 10 to the 4th. Here's 10 to the 3.3. Really, it kind of almost looks like 3.5. So maybe it should be a little further over this way, but we're not going to worry about that. But I've, I've log located it pretty accurately. It is a pole. So at the pole frequency, it is going through minus 45 degrees. And a decade below, that's easy to find. Just go down a decade. It's at zero. Decade above, it's going to be minus 90. 
So I've got all my pieces. Now I just have to add to get my wiggler. So over here, I'm at zero. Now my pole kicks in, so I'm going to follow it. Whoops, here a zero kicks in. So the zero and the pole will cancel until I get over here where I've got a, another pole. And so now I'll go down a little further, but now this pole stops contributing. So I'm going to get flat. And then eventually out here, this pole will stop contributing. And I'm going to go down until this pole stops contributing. I did that kind of fast. So back up the video if you didn't catch that and do it, do it yourself. Make sure you agree with this. But also, you notice we calculated our terminal phase here and said it's minus 90. Hey, look. Our terminal phase is minus 90. Looks like my hole punch cut off part of my minus 9 here. But this agrees with this. There are so many ways to check your work in EE310. So I put this into MATLAB. <coughs> and all I'm using here is that little compute frequency response um, program that I show you, my little script. You can use Bodhi if you want. <coughs> it's a nice MATLAB function. I like this one just because I can put my transfer function right into it. Um, but either way works. But bottom line is I set up a nice um, sweep that is linear in the log domain, so my points are nicely equally spaced, like we talked about uh, two lectures ago. And inside my loop where I'm sweeping the frequencies, I just shove my transfer function in there. And you can do this with any transfer function for any piece of homework. That's why I'm hoping you use this. If you're not in my class, if you're seeing this lecture out on the internet, um, send me an email. B door, that's B D O R R at sdsu.edu. Tell me who you are, tell me what you're doing, because I always like to hear from people, and I'll shoot you a copy of this thing. But here I I evaluate my transfer function at the frequency iteration of this loop. I put my magnitude response in the matrix, I put my frequency response in the matrix, I plot it out, let's run it. And here's my magnitude, here's my phase. Is this made of flat lines? No, but they are kind of. I mean, it's kind of flat here. It's kind of, kind of um, curving at the right number of dB per decade here. It certainly is here. Let's compare it to the Bode plot. So we'll go back, and I've, I've superimposed the Bode plot um, on what I got from MATLAB. Um, you're going to see I had to do a few tweaks in the program for radians per second versus hertz. Um, and you can also see that it looks like MATLAB is giving me graticules logarithmically. Um, either way, um, but the magnitude, <coughs> the Bode plot really nails it. Look how accurate that is. The only reason I didn't draw my wiggler right on top of this line is it would have confused them. Same, same deal down here. It's dead on here. It's dead on here. <coughs> it's pretty good here. <coughs> Phase response, our poles and zeros were a little bunched up down here, and things got a little busy, and our phase response is not quite as accurate. But it's still really good. Um, Bode plots, useful, not useful. Um, for this particular transfer function, I would probably have done a magnitude plot, but for the phase, I might have just let MATLAB do it. Here I just wanted to show you the um, MATLAB code again. And you can see I had to do a, a few little wiggles in here to, to make it work in radian in hertz versus radians. Um, 
in radians versus hertz um, because my frequency response program, I made it to work in hertz because that's what we practically use in industry. So I had to make a couple little tweaks to it, but it's just the basic program. And please use it. Have fun with it. Check your homework with it. Get good at using it. Use it to check your work on my quizzes and exams if they're um, if we're doing them online. Uh, make sure to do all the work by hand. Otherwise, you don't get any credit. But use this to check your work. In this example problem, you'll see two things. One is I'm plotting my Bode plot using hertz on the horizontal axis instead of radians as I had before. And then I'm going to reinforce the trick that I showed you in the last lecture um, where we started at the pole frequency or zero frequency and went down some number of decades times 20 dB per decade and got a very accurate answer. So those are the two things that uh, we have going in this example. So I want to plot the magnitude response as a function of frequency in hertz <clears throat> for this transfer function. The transfer function is given the way we get transfer functions. It is a function of omega. And so what we need to do is we need to convert this to hertz. So the pole frequency, you can see that it's all right in the form we want it to be in for Bode plotting. We got our 1 right here. And let's figure out what the pole frequency is in hertz. The pole frequency in radians per second is 21. So the frequency is going to be 21 divided by 2 pi equals 3.34 hertz. So I want to <clears throat> locate my 3.34 hertz on my Bode plot. So what I'm going to do is just take the base 10 log of it. Um, before I do that, of course, um, let's plot the constant, which is 8. 20 times log of 8 is going to be 18 dB. So that's going to be up here. And so now my pole frequency is 3.34 hertz. And I take the log of that, and that's 10 to the 0.5237. <clears throat> Notice I'm working in frequency. Fine. Decades are decades. So I'm going to mark my pole frequency of 10 to the 0.5237, and here's 10 to the 0, here's 10 to the 1, so 0.52 is about halfway between them. Hey, use your imagination. It's going to be about right here. So there's my pole frequency, and I know I'm going to go down at minus 20 dB per decade from here. So I didn't even bother to write my 18 dB all the way across. I just figured out where my pole frequency was and said, oh, it's right here. That's where my 18 dB line is going to turn into you know, falling at 20 dB per decade. So I, I didn't show all the steps. I kind of did it quickly. And so now I've got my Bode plot. That was the first thing we wanted to do, was get a magnitude response. But now I want to find the magnitude at 5,280 hertz. So where is that on this curve? Well, it's between 1,000 and 10,000. I know that. Let's get it more accurate. The base 10 log is going to be 3.72. Here's 10 to the 2, 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4. 10 to the 3.72. So I'll go about three quarters of the way from here to here. And I see about minus 47 dB. Because here's 40, here's minus 60, here's minus 50. So I'm going to call that minus 47. But I want to do better than that. And this is this Bode analysis trick that I like so much that has saved me so many times um, in meetings and design reviews and working with my engineers and stuff. What I'm going to do for my better approximation is 
I will get the number of decades between my pole frequency and 5,280 hertz. How many decades is it between here and here? That's easy. We'll do the math. 10 to the number of decades is equal to 50, 5,280 divided by 3.34. So we go x log 10 equals base 10 log of this, and we solve for x. I just remember the number of decades between something is the base 10 log of the one thing divided by the other thing. I just remember that. But we're 3.2 decades. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to start at 18.06 and we are going to go down 3. Point, what was it 26 no 3.2 decades at 20 db per decade that's easy enough so my equation is just 18.06 plus 3.2 decades times negative 20 db per decade this is dead on accurate why is it accurate because I was really careful to make sure I was a long way from the pole frequency. If I was looking right at the pole frequency, of course this plot would give me a 3 dB error. Because I know that at this break frequency, um, the actual frequency response is 3 dB below that. We showed that in our last lecture. But by the time I get way far away, um, the two lines are going to be indistinguishable. So this is nice. This is dead on. Okay, so I promise you that the 6 dB per octave thing was going to be very simple. And so let's do it. But before we do it, I guess, why octaves, why decades? When we're doing RF stuff, uh, when I'm doing RF stuff, I typically think in decades. But when I'm doing musical acoustic stuff, I think in terms of octaves, because I can sing octaves. I, I can sing an octave above, you know, whatever, whatever uh, tone. So in music and audio, you tend to want to just work in octaves. And so what is the roll off in dB per octaves for a single pole? Well, we know that if we, we know that we go down 20 dB for a decade, but what do we do for a factor of two or an octave? We'll go right back and do the same thing we did for decades. Delta dB equals 20 times the log to the base 10 of two omega divided by omega. Or in other words, how many dB are we going to change when we are at um, twice the frequency. And 20 times the log of 2 is 6.02 dB. So this is going to give us our roll-off in octaves. So the two statements, 20 dB per decade and 6 dB per octave, are interchangeable statements. They mean the exact same thing. Let's find out how many octaves we have between two frequencies. And to do that, we're going to say 2 to the number of octaves is equal to the ratio of the frequencies. Now, if you're not entirely comfortable with this, stop the video and check it out. 2 raised to the number of octaves is going to be the ratio between the two frequencies. Um, try to get comfortable with that. You're not going to get 100% comfortable. because I know it took me a long time to be 100% comfortable, but get kind of comfortable. Now let's work it out. N, and I'm going to just use natural logs here. N natural log 2 equals the natural log of F2 over F1 solve for n, and I get n equals the natural log of f2 over f1 divided by the natural log 
of 2. And this is a formula that I always remember. Works for decades, too. If you put 10 here, um, you'll get the number of decades. If you put a 5 here, you're in base 5. Doesn't, doesn't really matter. So um, this tells us how many octaves we are. How many decades? Put a 10. Let's look at the last problem. Um, what you might want to do is go back and revisit that problem using octaves instead of decades and then see how I did it. But what I did is I said the number of octaves between 5,280 and the pole frequency using my formula here is the number of octaves is the natural log of 5280 divided by 3.34 divided by the natural log of 2, that's 10.62 octaves. Really? I'm going to do it on my fingers. Here we go. 3 hertz. One octave gives me 6 hertz. Another octave, 12 hertz. Another octave, 24 hertz. Another octave, 50 hertz. Another octave, 100 hertz. 200 hertz, 400 hertz, 800 hertz, 1600 hertz, 3200 hertz, 6400 hertz. 6400 hertz would be 11 octaves. So it's greater than 10 octaves, less than 11 octaves, 5280. So that makes sense. The number of octaves work out. And it's easy to do. You just do it on your fingers if you have to. That's what I do. And so my equation becomes 18.06 dB. Start at 18.06 and go down 6.02 dB per octave times 10.62 octaves. And I get the exact same answer negative 40.9, 45.9 dB. All right, now I want to tell you a little bit about poles and zeros because we have used this, these terms, but we haven't really defined them. And if you don't have an intuitive feel for them, you might be going like, what? Poles, zeros, what, what the hell does that all mean? And I want to give you some insight into that. So here's a transfer function, h of s. And you can see I've put it in a classical form that we use for control theory. It's a classical second order form. It works for our purposes right here. And the poles are the values of s where the denominator polynomial is 0. The denominator goes to 0. That means the transfer function becomes infinite. So if we have the, the two values of s that make this go to 0, the roots of this quadratic, those are the poles of our transfer function. Now, when there's also a polynomial in the numerator, the zeros are the value of s where the numerator evaluates to zero, and therefore the transfer function becomes zero. Now, I don't have to have complex poles here. I could have simple poles here. And the value of s of my sim that the value of s that makes my simple pole go to zero is the pole frequency. So we know here that the poles are going to be complex, and therefore, since all these coefficients are real, they have to be complex conjugates. So here are some poles that are conjug complex conjugates, and I'm plotting them on the real imaginary axis. Here's the j omega part of the pole, and here is the real part of the pole. Now let's say I had a simple pole. If it was just a simple pole, like 1 plus j omega over 12 or something like that, then 
I would have a pole on the real axis at minus 12. But for these ones, I have complex values, and they occur as complex conjugates. So what we said here is that if this is h of s, the poles are the value where the denominator goes to 0. If it goes to 0, the transfer function blows up and goes to infinity. Let's look. Here is my j omega axis, and here is my real axis, and here is the magnitude of the transfer function. So, in other words, you're looking at a three-dimensional plot of this picture. We're going to turn this picture a little bit, and then we're going to use the axis coming out at us as our magnitude axis. And we show it in three dimensions, and thank goodness someone could draw this, because I never could. But if the, pole, if the frequency is, eager, e, e, is equal to the pole frequency, this function blows up and its magnitude goes to infinity. Here are your pole frequencies. Here's your real part. Here's your imaginary part. There's your, um, there's your magnitude. Why do we call it a pole? See it going up? Kind of looks like a pole. Now let's say that we have zeros and, and our, our um, function here is up here. So now the roots of this function, we're going to call them the zeros, and they are the values of s where the numerator evaluates to zero. So of course the magnitude's going to go to zero. Let's look at zeros. Here's zeros. Look, the magnitude went to zero. So that is why we call the um, these things poles and zeros. The pole frequencies are going to be the, or the actual poles are going to be the frequency where the magnitude goes to zero. Now what we're calculating are break frequencies which are along the j omega axis. And we kind of call those pole frequencies. But this is the, the truest definition of a pole. So let's take a look at a, a transfer function in light of the real and imaginary axis. And I'm going to give you a feel for how we can get the frequency response from the pole zero plot. Or in other words, we're going to plot our poles with little x's, and we're going to plot our zeros with little o's, and those are characteristics of the circuit, so they don't move around. The poles and zeros are the frequency at where those pieces of the transfer function go crazy. And so they're a function, they are a characteristic of the circuit. But what I'm going to show you is how we can get the frequency response just by knowing those poles and zeros. And you might say, well, what good is that? Well, here's the deal. We can get the frequency response from the poles and zeros, but people that are a lot smarter than I'll ever be can figure out how to geometrically arrange the poles and zeros so they get a desired frequency response. And if you've worked with electri um, um, filters, um, you'll see that you have elliptic filters and you have Butterworth filters. And really what those names correspond to is how the poles are organized on this plot. Um, so I just want to give you a sense for that. So here's the magnitude of a transfer function. It's going to be 1 over the magnitude of s minus p1 times s minus p2. And here is p1, and here is p2. And those don't move with frequency. But when I measure frequency response, I use a sine wave. 
and my input is going to be Vn equals e to the j omega t plus e to the minus j omega t over 2. What we're going to do for now is we're going to just use one of these. Because remember, back in lecture, I believe, 6 or 7, we talked about how we're really exciting circuits with complex exponentials. That's what all of our AC circuit analysis is based on. So S is equal to J omega. So enter my little delta here. And what the delta shows is what the frequent is the frequency where we are evaluating the frequency response. So if I'm at DC, my delta is down here. If I'm at infinite frequency, my delta is up here. So that's the game. We know that these are the poles of our circuit. These are those frequencies where the response goes to zero. My delta represents the frequency at which I wish to evaluate the frequency response. So what I see here is I have a distance from each pole to my delta. And that distance is equal to the magnitude of S, which is my j omega, minus P1, and S minus P2. That distance is this magnitude. That magnitude is this magnitude. So this tells us something really cool, which is that we can get the magnitude of the frequency response by just looking at the diff distance between the frequency we have picked and the poles because here are the values. So let's take a look at that. I'm going to take my delta and I'm going to put it down here at DC. So here's my delta down at DC and that means the frequency is zero so let's get the magnitude of the frequency response at DC. It is going to be 1 over this distance times this distance, 1 over d1 times d2. And let's say that it comes out right around here. Now what I'm going to do is I am going to move, I'm going to move my delta up and it's going to do a little flyby by this pole. And when it does, it's going to, the distance between my delta and this pole is going to be minimized. So since I have a minima in the denominator, I'm going to get a maximum for the function. And so as, uh, as I get to this frequency, which is the frequency where my little delta does a little flyby here, I get a maximum. Okay? Now, what we're going to do is we're going to raise the frequency even higher, which means that my triangle is going to crawl way up this axis. And D1 and D2 are going to be about the same because it will be when I'm up here on my axis, it'll be really hard to tell the difference between them, but my magnitude will be 1 over big times big, and so it's going to be very small. So I'm going to go back down and I'm going to just keep going down. So what I did here is I showed that for my little, my little circuit that had two conjugate poles out here, I my frequency response started at some value at DC and then it kind of peaked a little bit and that happened when my my delta did a flyby underneath this pole and the denominator uh, minimized and then it went to zero. So I can get the frequency response doing this.
So now that we know what poles and zeros actually are, <clears throat> let's look at how they relate to Bode plots. So we'll take our transfer function, <coughs> excuse me, and we'll put it in the form that we like for Bode plots. We've got our 1 plus <coughs> j omega over omega p1, 1 plus j omega over omega p2. We showed earlier that the exact response at omega p for a single pole is minus 3 dB. So for a single pole, h of s is equal to s minus p1. And the magnitude of h of s is 1 over, I'm sorry, is the magnitude of 1 over s minus p1. And the magnitude of that, if we use Pythagorean theorem, <clears throat> is going to be root of um, omega squared plus p1 squared. So you can see that if s is set equal to p1, then the response is 1 over root 2. So let's say we have a single pole at alpha equals minus 3 radians per second. Or in other words, alpha at minus 3, we have just a single pole here. Well, then we say in Bode plotting that our omega p is going to be at 3. Because we know that when we get to 3, when our little delta gets up to 3, I'm going to have 3 units that way, 3 units that way, and I'm going to have um, root 2 times 3 this way. And so I know that's all kind of confusing, but if you have any interest in filters, or when I show you some really, really nice frequency responses of filters, um, this is where all this comes from. I'd like to give you another presentation of this that's a little bit the same but we'll hopefully pound it in a little further. So we'll start off with h of s, and I've got some function here. I have a quadratic in the numerator. I have a quadratic in the denominator. And so the roots of this are going to be my poles, and the roots of this are going to be my zeros. And so let's, let's divide this up. So up here, I have, a, I have real zeros, because the roots of this polynomial are real. But the, the poles, or the roots of the denominator transfer function, are going to be complex. And so I actually solved it out all the way out. So here is my transfer function, kind of in its factored form, where I can see the zeros and the poles. So I'm going to have zeros at negative 1 and negative 4, and I'm going to have a complex set of poles at minus 2 plus or minus j3. Okay, so the zero frequencies are the frequencies where the transfer function is zero, obviously. The pole frequency is the frequencies where the transfer function is infinite, just like my cool little pole zero three-dimensional picture that, of course, I copied out of a textbook because I could never draw that. So let's draw these. Here are my poles and zeros. I have zeros at negative 1. Here's my zero. It's got the little round symbol. And here's my second zero at minus 4. And here are my poles. The real part is negative 2, and then I go plus j3 and minus j3. So here's the pole zero plot for this transfer function. Now I want to get the frequency response from the pole zero plot. And I just showed you how to do that, but I'm going to kind of give you another little presentation of that. So to compute the frequency response, I'm going to let s equal j omega. And the magnitude of the transfer function is just going to be the product of the zero magnitudes divided by the product of the pole magnitudes. 
and what these vectors are, or what this value is, s minus z1, is just the distance between my value s here, which is the frequency at which I'm evaluating, and p1, or z2, or whatever. So the frequency, the magnitude of the frequency response at this frequency, j1.5, is equal to this distance times this distance divided by this distance divided by this distance. So it's all about these distances. And I want you to stick with me for a second. Let's look at what happens if we change the frequency. All these little lines are going to keep going to my dot. See all the lines moving? Now the lines are following me down this way, like this line is now coming over here. And so that is how we get the frequency response. Let's do it for this particular function. At 0 hertz, um, I'm, I have a fairly small distance over to this 0. and so I'm going to get some finite value. It's going to be this distance. Remember, at 0 hertz or dc, my little delta is going to be down here. So it's going to be this distance times this distance divided by this distance divided by this distance. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to now start increasing my frequency. And eventually, I'm going to do a little flyby by this um, pole. And that means my denominator is going to get kind of small, which means my function is going to be kind of big when I go by here. Now let's go up to infinity. And now, really, the distance to all these is about the same, isn't it, when I'm up here? So. At infinity, my transfer function should be equal to 1. So I'm going to get something at 0, and, but it's certainly going to be smaller than 1. And then I'm going to have a little flyby, so I'm going to have a little frequency peaking going on. And then I'm going to go to 1 as I, my frequency goes to infinity. And here it is. Low frequency, I had a pretty low value. Here's the frequency peaking as I went by the pole frequency. And here is my value of 1 or 0 dB at very high frequencies. So before we leave this, let's make this more practical. Let's match up the pole 0 plots here and the frequency response plots. So I'll start here, and, and the game is we're going to move our little delta up the j omega axis starting at dc. I could go to negative frequency if I wanted, but I'm just going to do positive frequency. And we're going to look at the distance from the zeros divided by the distance to the poles. Now, in this case, the transfer function is going to be just 1 divided by um, the distance to this pole. And so here, I'm going to get 1 over this distance. And the distance from my delta to the pole is just going to keep getting bigger, which means the denominator is going to just keep getting bigger. So the function, the magnitude, is going to get smaller. So that looks kind of like this. At DC, I had the greatest magnitude because my denominator was the smallest. At infinite hertz, my denominator was huge and my numerator was still 1. So we're going to match this one with here. Now we have a 0 um, at what we call the origin. Um, this would be like our j omega term all by itself. And so at 0, when my delta is here, 
the, diff the distance from my delta to the zero is zero, so I got no response at DC. But as I go up here, the two distances become about the same, and so at high frequencies, I'm going to have this distance divided by this distance. They're going to be the same, so it's going to be 1. So my frequency will start off, my response will start off at 0, and it will, at high frequencies, be 1. Here's one that does that. I'll buy it. Look at the difference between this one and this one. This one gave us a low pass. This one gave us a low pass. This one gave us a high pass filter. OK, so now I'm going to have two zeros at the origin. I kind of had to show them next to each other, so it looks like an infinity, but it's really two zeros on top of each other. And I have two complex poles. And so as I move my delta up, I'm going to do a little flyby under this pole. And so I'm going to get a minimization of my denominator. So I'm going to get some frequency peaking. And then when I get way up here, again, all the distances will be the same. So it'll be 1. So who does that for me? Well, let's see. I got no response at 0. That looks good here. And then as I do my flyby by this uh, pole, I get some peaking. That is an ugly graph. But hopefully it gets the idea across. And when I get to infinity, I'm not going to 0 like this one. I'm going to 0 dB like this one. So that is this particular uh, response. Now, what you might be noticing is, hey, when he gets complex poles, he starts getting frequency peaking. Remember how we did frequency peaking at the end of the last lecture and we said it depends on the damping coefficient? Well, the damping coefficient just tells us how close our poles are to the J omega axis. If my pole was even closer to the J omega axis, I'd get a serious minimization on the denominator, and this would go, whoa, and then come down. See that? So that's where that damping ratio toadstool helps you so much. OK, now let's actually look at that in a little more. I just have two complex poles. And they're very close to the J omega axis. I have no zeros. So I have some response down at DC. And then when I go under here, whoa, that thing's really going to peak because the, diff the distance from my delta to my denominator really minimizes. So I'm going to get a serious peak there. But now when I'm up here, my numerator is still going to be 1 because I got no zeros, and it's going to be 1 over big times big. So it's going to be 1 over huge, and I'm going to get zeros. So that's going to give me this one. I started at something. I had some serious frequency peaking because my pole was kind of close to my axis, and I eventually went down to 0. You know, there's a point you could move this pole such that it's so far away that, yeah, that flyby doesn't really mean much and we don't get any real frequency peaking. Well, that is going to be your damping ratio of 1. Now let's look at this one. Here we have some zeros that are right on the J omega axis and we have some poles that are very close to them. Let's start at 0. So at 0, I have my distance to my zeros is about the same as the distance to the poles. So I'm going to say that my response is going to be about 1. And these are pretty close together. So as I go up here, my response is going to kind of stay pretty close to 1 until I get right here, and then it's going to go to 0. 
And then as I go further, all these are going to become about the same, and I am going to get 1 again. So again, I started off at 1, and then at this frequency, I have my 0. I have no distance to the 0, so my response becomes 0. And then if I keep going, it becomes 1 again. That looks like this frequency response curve right here. Start off at 0 dB. We have no response at this frequency. We go back to 0 dB. Useful filter. Uh, if you were trying to eliminate a tone at this particular frequency, this would be just what you need. Now let's look at one that's kind of one of my favorites. Here I have poles um, over here in the left-hand plane and zeros in the right-hand half plane, and they are arranged as a square. So what we'll do is we'll start off here, and the distance from DC to this pole is equal to the distance to this zero. So that puts a one in the, nom in the denominator and a one in the, I'm sorry, it creates a one in my transfer function. And these do the same thing. And if I move my delta up a little bit, this pole distance is the same as this zero distance. This pole distance is the same as this zero distance. If I keep going up, this pole distance will be the same as that zero distance. This, so you see the magic here? In other words, no matter what the frequency is, the response will always be unity. And I'm going to get this. Flat frequency response. Now, you might say, well, if you get flat frequency response, why would you ever do that? And here's why. Because what I didn't mention up here is just as we can, we can, um, multiply out these distances to get the magnitude response, we can add up all the phase angles to get the phase response. So the cool thing about this network is the magnitude response is flat, but the phase response is going all over the place. And we use this network as what you call a group delay equalizer. It modifies the phase of a transfer function only, not the magnitude. So that's our second Bode plot lecture. A um, lot to comprehend today. I hope that you've made it through with me through this last stuff, because this really is the essence of how filters are designed and how they work. If you understand this, this will just give you a tremendous leg up on understanding transfer functions and circuits and, and stuff like that. So I will see you at the next lecture. And for all my students, I hope to see you all at the next office hour.